Hey guys, it's Chris from Highline Guitars, and you're watching another episode of From the Luthier's Workbench. In this episode, I'm going to cover part three of the steampunk guitar build. And at the end of the last episode, which you can click the link above to go back and watch it if you want to get caught up. But in that episode, I had mentioned that I would talk about the process that I follow in preparing files to carve a fretboard, a neck, and a body on my CNC machine. So I think really the best way to understand how that process works is to understand the basics of how my CNC works. And this is true really with all CNC machines. But I use the CNC machine to do two types of carving operations, two-dimensional carving and three-dimensional carving. Two-dimensional carving is anytime you're cutting shapes such as the perimeter of a guitar body or the pockets for the pickup, the neck, and the uh, control cavity. Those are basically just straight up and down cutting operations. Three-dimensional carving is when you are carving a complex contoured shape such as the back of a neck or in the case of a, of a guitar that has a carved top, like a, a Les Paul style guitar, that gentle contour is a three-dimensional shape. So it requires three-dimensional carving. Now, in order to prepare the files, I have to uh, approach it either as a two-dimensional process or the three-dimensional process, because for me, they're a little bit different. And the way I start out the process is I begin by drawing a full-size, full-scale drawing of the guitar, usually a top view. And I use Adobe Illustrator to create that drawing. And you can use pretty much any sort of a CAD program or other vector program. I use Illustrator because it plays well with the other programs that I use in the process. So it works for me. But once I have my full-size, full-scale top view drawing of the guitar in Illustrator, I can use the elements from that drawing to begin the process of building the files that I will need to generate the G-code to run my machine. So what I'll do is I will identify which carving operations for a specific guitar are going to require 3D carving and which operations will require 2D two-dimensional carving operations. And then I will go from there and I will begin the process of uh, assembling those files. Now for the 3D work that I do, I will typically use Rhinoceros 3D for the Macintosh to create my 3D models. And that's usually going to be the neck, the body, and the perimeter and radius of the fretboard. Those are the 3D shapes that I'm going to need. And once I have built those 3D models, I can export them as STL files and use those in my CAM program, which is MeshCAM, where I can assign the tool paths and write the G code. Now for the two-dimensional carving operations, I use a slightly different approach. I will export those elements from Adobe Illustrator as .svg files. And then I will import those into an online program from Inventables called Easel, which is the software program that they developed to use with the XCarve CNC machine. And I used to use the XCarve, and it worked really, really well for me for several years before I got the bug to build my own CNC machine. But I still like to use Easel because of its features. And what I can do is I can bring those SVG files into Easel and assign the bits, the tool paths, and then from there write the G code for two-dimensional carving. It's incredibly simple. But the really nice thing about Easel is, is not only does it allow me to create those two-dimensional G code files, it's a G code sender program. So I can connect to my CNC machine using Easel and I can export that G-code right to my CNC machine and carve. But what really makes it work well for me is the fact that I can import my three-dimensional G-code files into Easel and then use Easel to send those files. So what I can do is I can set up a project in Easel where I have 
uh, pages for each cutting operation. And in each of those pages are the files, either two-dimensional or three-dimensional, that I'm going to be carving on my CNC machine. And that allows me to set up the project in a series of steps that I can review and make sure I've got everything covered before I ever plug in and start up the CNC machine. So it makes it very efficient and it works, for me it works really well. So now let's jump in and I'll kind of show you the different carving operations. Okay, well, this is the top side of the neck after I have completed the cutting operations for the truss rod slot and then the headstock angle, the face of the headstock. And the truss rod will fit just like that. And then the fretboard will be positioned, glued into place like this. So what I need to do now is I need to cut the back, the uh, both the the headstock, the back of the headstock and the and its perimeter, as well as the the next contour and the heel. However, before I can do that, what I want to do is I'm going to take this block over to my bandsaw and I'm going to cut out a section of this back of the of the blank in order to reduce the amount of time necessary to cut it on the CNC machine. So I'll do that right now. So as you can see, a couple of minutes on the bandsaw will save a considerable amount of time on the CNC machine. And this was the original center point and this is my home position for the carves. There was one on the front and now there's also one on the back. So by cutting this away I had to transfer that line. So what I'll do is I'll use this center line to make sure that the blank is square with the y-axis and then I'll position my router right over that center point and that's going to be the home position to start the cuts for the back of the headstock as well as the uh, contour and the heel for the back of the neck.
As I mentioned before, I like to make my neck and fretboard separately and all the way to completion. That way, if I run into a problem, either with the wood or, you know, God forbid I make a mistake or a miscalculation, I've only lost that one part. A lot of guys like to glue a fretboard blank to a neck blank and then start their cutting, carving, slotting, drilling, and that sort of work. And unfortunately, there's always a possibility that if you discover a flaw in the wood or you make a mistake, then you've lost both pieces. And in the case of using expensive exotic woods, that can be really frustrating. Now, this is only likely going to happen if you're building a lot of guitars. And, you know, out of a hundred necks, you may have one or two where you encounter a mistake. If you're only building one guitar, the chances of that happening are far less likely. However, it can happen, and it did happen as I was building this guitar. As I was carving this neck, I encountered a mineral streak that was running along the length of the neck. Now, I couldn't see this in the blank. It was hidden under the surface. As the CNC machine started carving away that wood, that mineral streak was revealed. Now, a mineral streak is something that you know, may not bother some folks, but if I'm gonna put this guitar up for sale, I can't have a mineral streak. If I'm gonna stain that wood, the mineral streak is only gonna stand out and become more apparent than, you know, if I didn't stain it. If I'm gonna paint the neck, which is what my plan or my, and my intention is with this guitar, there's always a possibility down the road that that mineral streak could suddenly start to appear in the, in the color that I put down. Uh, you have to remember a mineral streak is, it's, a, it's basically a type of mold and it can reveal itself even up through uh, paint or finish. So I had to deal with it. And there was really two ways that I could deal with that problem with this particular guitar. Number one, I could just chuck the blank and make a new one. The other way is to kind of check and see how deep that streak goes. So what I did was I grabbed one of my little, it's a little U-shaped scooping chisel, and I just simply ran it along the length of that uh, stain to see, you know, carving it away to see how deep it went. Well, as luck would have it, it just penetrated below the surface. If I had made this neck a little bit thinner with my CNC machine, I would have probably carved it all away. But under the circumstances, it, I, I didn't do it that way. So by removing the stain with my chisel, I, I was left with a little bit of a carved groove in the neck. All I had to do was fill that with some fine sawdust, flood it with CA glue, and then spritz it with a little accelerator. Then I went back and sanded it, and it is completely filled in to where you can't see it. I'm confident that with a coat of color and clear coats, you'll never know it was there. So I was able to salvage this and continue on with it and I didn't have to toss it away. But if I was gonna stain this neck and I already had my fretboard in place when I carved it, I would have revealed that mineral stain and I would have had to start all over, make a new fretboard, make a new neck. But in this case, uh, we're, uh, we're good to go. So what I'm gonna do in the next episode is I'm going to bring these two pieces together. The neck is, uh, is, for the most part, completely finished, as is the fretboard, so we're ready to join the two. Now, because I am going to paint this neck, I have to kind of deal with the glue up a little bit differently than I normally do. Uh, I need to address the fact that I'm going to be painting the back of this neck while leaving the fretboard natural. So I have to account for the layers of paint and finish. And that's something I'm going to deal with as I prepare to glue it up. So be sure to catch the next episode as I bring these two together and continue on with the steampunk build. So until the next episode, I hope you have a great weekend, a great week ahead. Stay tuned, and I'll see you soon.